Hey everyone, and welcome to Key Conversations for Leaders. I'm your host, John Ryan, and today we have a very special guest, Dr. David Bradford. David is a Eugene O'Kelly II Senior Lecturer Emeritus in Leadership at Stanford Graduate School of Business. Along with Carol Robin, uh, they have taught interpersonal skills to MBA candidates for a combined 75 years in their legendary course, Interpersonal Dynamics, affectionately known to generations of students as touchy feely and have coached and consulted hundreds of executives for decades in their book connect building exceptional relationships with family friends and colleagues they show readers how to take their relationships from from shallow to exceptional by cultivating authenticity vulnerability and honesty while being willing to ask for and offer help share a commitment to growth and deal productively with conflict he has written several other books including influencing up and reinventing organizational development new approaches to change in organization thank you so much for being here dr bradford i'm glad to be here looking forward to this you know the first thing i wanted to ask was what drew you professionally to researching and exploring fulfilling relationships uh, what do I do? How do I do that? It's um, it, it's it's largely based on the course that you mentioned, but it's also based on the consulting that uh, Carol and I have done. And uh, it's what we observe and what we see that successful executives do and what they do that causes them to shoot themselves in the foot. So we have years and years of this is sort of observable data. Wonderful. What was it that brought you in? Because before the show, we were talking about that you you actually started this course many, many years ago yourself, designed the curriculum for Touchy Feely. What was it initially that drew you to the concepts that you both presented through that course through so many years? Well, I think it was two things. One is I've always been interested in interpersonal relations in terms of what it is that allows people to connect at a more meaningful level. Um, I'm not sure where personally that came from, but it's always been an interest of mine. And then when we start, I started to develop the course and I saw the effect, the effect was very powerful. Uh, and I said, gee, there's something going on here that when you can get people to relate in a more open, uh, authentic way, uh, as Carol and I say, magic happens. And, and students frequently say, this has been a transformational experience. We hear from alumni 20, 30 years later, I still use this material. So something powerful was going on that I want to explore in greater depth. So 20, 30 years later, you're still having students reach out and talking about the impact that their course with you impacted them. That sounds like a professor's dream, I imagine. It really is, because we always wonder, do we have an impact? And uh, in fact, I recently did a Zoom with some uh, uh, alumni that covered about 40 years. And they were saying, you know, I, I still use this, uh, not just at work, but I use it with my family. I use it with my spouse. And um, that's, uh, you know, we, we want to impact people and we want to impact people in all parts of their life. So with some of the courses and the concepts that are presented in your book and also the, the course, the Touchy Philly course, it's really about building that exceptional relationship and putting energy, I imagine, into that. How do you define or what does an exceptional relationship really look like? Good. Uh, before I get there, let me put that within a perspective. Uh, relationships are on a continuum. Not all of them can be or should be uh, exceptional. We want friends, we want colleagues, we want companions. Uh, so we have to think of this as a continuum, but these dimensions that I'm going to talk about relate to all points along the continuum, just to varying degrees. So the first thing is, uh, can I be myself? Can I let you know parts that are relevant um, and not just share the sort of common things that one would share with anybody, but that share more personal things. Um, you know, as you said, I'm emeritus, so I'm retiring. So for me, an issue is um, coming to terms with age and aging, that's more personal. Uh, and I'm um, having some trouble with my eyesight, uh, which is uh, upsetting because I'm a person that likes to read a lot. So the first one is, can I, tell you a little bit more about me. 
Second, can I build conditions where you're willing to share more about you? Because the more each of us share, the more we trust each other, the more areas we have to connect and not just connect on similarities, but uh, you may do something different that I've never done. And that's very intriguing, but I, I need to know you in order to make those sort of connections. The third is um, in sharing this, can we trust this information won't be used against us? And uh, this is often an issue in organizations that we're afraid of, that people will use this and uh, for their own benefit, but at my uh, expense. I think the uh, underlying all this, the fourth dimension is, can we be honest with each other? And it doesn't mean that I share everything, but I share enough so that you know what's going on with me and you don't have to read between the lines. I think fifth, um, when we get to know each other, uh, hopefully it builds a relationship, but we're gonna find areas where we disagree. We'll do things that bother each other. Can we raise these disagreements and resolve them in a way that also strengthens the relationship? Because it can be a sign of commitment that I wanna raise it. And finally, are we um, both committed to each other's growth and development? Now that's a very, very high standard. We say if you have four or five relationships that are high in all of these, you're a fortunate person. But these relate to all points on the continuum. Amazing. Thank you so much for, for sharing those points on that continuum. And imagine working with your students, your individual coaching clients, and the companies that you work with. You know, one of the things that might come up, and I imagine you've encountered this, is fear. I talk to people yes. all the time who are, the company wants to do a trust initiative and going through an experience of sharing things. And yet, the people I work with, they're like, I don't feel comfortable in doing that because I've seen it where it's been used against them. Where, where do you, as a leader, intervene in that situation? Is it that you have to establish the grounds or I don't even know how to, can it be, can it be fixed? Or is there always that dichotomy of trust versus exposure, if you will? Well, all of this is fear. Uh, it's underlined. Otherwise it would be easy to do. You know, you're saying, do I dare share things that might be used against me? Uh, how honest can I be? And John, if you're my boss, I'm gonna think twice before I say, you know, you're doing some stuff that's bothering me. Uh, we've all experienced that conflict can damage a relationship. There's no guarantee. So fear underlies it. I think what the leader needs to do is not just to say the good things, uh, but to demonstrate them. Can the leader in essence uh, be more self-disclosing? Uh, so often leaders think that I've got to present this image of, uh, of that I'm perfect, that I can solve all problems and so on. And leaders need to convey that, yes, this problem is going to be solved, but they can also ask for help. And they can say, you know, we need to pull together because I can't do this alone. That's not a sign of weakness. That's a sign of being uh, uh, human. If somebody disagrees with the leader, can the leader say, uh, Gee, I don't see it that way, but I really am appreciative that you had the courage to confront me. Uh, so it's rewarding the courage for doing it, even if I may not agree with the content. So there's many things a leader can do to model. And often the leaders do things that model the opposite, as we all know. So true. So true. From the employee perspective, the other side, if you have a leader who is not establishing those parameters and celebrating vulnerability and courage, like you mentioned, is it okay for them to withhold information and, and not share their vulnerable and show their underbelly? Yeah, I, I think we all need to be cautious. Um, I mean, we don't want a career limiting move. One of the things we say to the students I'm gonna give two suggestions. The first one is what we say to the students is use the 15% rule. And what we mean by that is I want you to think of three uh, concentric circles. The inner one is my zone of safety. It's my comfort zone. And I can share things that with anybody and not be worried. The second one is a zone of learning. And the outer one is a zone of danger, which you don't want to get to. So we need to be wise and judicious. 
But what we say to students is, and to clients is, can you move 15% outside of your zone of comfort into the zone of learning? So share a little bit more and see what happens. Usually that's not a disaster. So uh, let's talk about honesty. I um, may not want to confront you, boss, on uh, I think you made a terrible mistake in, uh, in the presentation, but I may want to say uh, something like, um, uh, I think there were some parts in that presentation that could have been even stronger. Can I help you with that? So uh, the, that doesn't get me into a danger zone. The boss may say, no, I'm doing fine. Then I'll drop it. Um, so, but what we usually find is the other person responds also with moving 15% out of their comfort zone. And um, then both of you become comfortable. So your comfort zone now expands and you can move another 15%. So, but if we stay within our comfort zone, nothing happens. So that 15% rule is, is it in a way testing the relationship, testing the waters to determine if it's safe or if I'm at that danger zone? It's doing that. And it's also uh, in testing the waters, seeing that um, it isn't quite as deep as I thought it was. So I can now stay waiting out in that uh, little water. I'm not way, way over my head swept away. So um, I now have more of the beach I could explore. And maybe I can take another 15 steps uh, without getting into, into danger. So it's, it's expanding in our relationship what we can talk about and what we can deal with. It sounds like the majority of people need to you know, take further steps and test the waters appropriately for their situation. Do you ever come across people who are on the hyper end of authenticity where it might be um i don't know it's basically uh, too raw or they just call it like it is and and don't consider other people and situation at all that's absolutely true and and what we say is you have to be aware of yourself what your concerns are what your hopes are but you also need to be aware of the other person it's i mean we're taught relationships are interpersonal. Uh, they're not narcissistic. They shouldn't be. And so I, I need to be aware of that. So if I'm sharing this with my boss, I'm going to watch his or her reactions. Uh, and I'm going to uh, also be aware of what the boss's concerns are. So another thing I could do is to be sensitive to what my boss is worried about. And bosses often express their concerns. Then can I link with the boss? So the boss says, I don't know why when I give these talks, people don't seem to respond. Well, you may have some hunches about that. So I can say, yeah, that's tough. And uh, I think I have some ideas that might increase their um, receptivity. Now the boss may say, well, it's all their fault. Well, she's signaling she doesn't want to hear, so I'm going to back off. But the boss is likely to say, well, what is it? And then I can say, well, when you made that point, you kept on talking about it uh, long after it was clear. So I think that's one of the things that caused people not to listen. And I know you're committed to that point, but, you know, you get it over pretty quickly. So if you cut it shorter, you'd be more effective. Boss might be likely to thank you. And not only that, bosses are often worried about being kept in the dark, that you've taken the risk, that you've had the guts to move that 15% is likely to impress the boss. Now, if I moved 55%, the boss may have a different reaction. Absolutely, I love that. When you're making, and, and I think both those examples, are, of course, not representative of all the choices, but in both those examples, you used a question. It seemed like you led with the 15%, the 15 steps with a question. Hey, I think I have some ideas on that. Would you like to hear them? I have some ideas on how you can improve the presentation. Is that soft approach? To, sounds like that might generate more receptivity than the attacking, here's what you should do kind of direct feedback in that sense. 
Yeah, in essence, feedback is to help the other person. And um, why give a gift when the other person doesn't want it? You know, we've all gotten an ugly tie for Christmas. <laughs> That's not a gift. So I want to check out, um, uh, is this something, it allows me to collect information on where the boss is or where the other person is, not just the boss, but I'm going to do that with a colleague. Uh, does a colleague really want to hear? So actually yesterday I was with a colleague and I raised an issue about some stuff he was writing. And he said, no, I'm happy with the way it's going. Okay. I raised it, but I'm not going to ram it down his throat. I still think he's wrong, but it's his writing, not my writing. How do you mentally, because I know sometimes when you, uh, try to offer that advice and try to, of course, to be of service and to help be helpful and productive and to not have that received. Do you personally ever have to like, do any work and kind of working through your mind about uh, an unfinished business, perhaps? Well, if this has been a relationship which has been strained uh, and has had difficulty in it, I'm going to have to put some effort into that relationship. And there's many ways I could do it. One is we know that when people work well together, relationships build. So I may want to focus on the task and help the other person. Or I may want to raise the issue directly. I want to may say, um, John, I, I'm finding myself being careful. I don't like doing that. And it's getting me to hold back stuff, which I think is helpful. Uh, I'm wondering if you're doing the same because uh, I would like a more open relationship. Then what I might want to ask, am I doing anything? Uh, because interpersonal problems often have an interpersonal component. Our tendency is to blame the other person, but I may have done something. Now, I should only raise that if I want to hear the answer. Because if, if you, John, say, well, as a matter of fact, David, you are doing something, and I say, no, I don't, that ain't going to help the relationship, is it? Not at all. Would the same thing apply with annoyances and pet peeves in a relationship that you would ask for feedback on if I'm ever doing something to annoy you, if you had something you wanted to share with me? I, I think so, because I'm asking the other person to be vulnerable. I'm saying, uh, uh, you know, what's going on in essence is something going on with you. Um, I want to level the playing field. Uh, I want to say I'm also willing to be vulnerable. And um, also, I, I think it makes it easier for the other person to share it. And, um, and also, I may learn something. I mean, I don't do everything perfectly. And maybe that I've done something unintentionally that uh, I didn't want to do. And now I'm finding out something. And in that process, I'm also demonstrating that I want a stronger relationship with you. So it's an affirming act. I'm doing this not to ream you out. I'm doing this because something's getting in the way of our work relationship, our friendship, whatever it is. And uh, I want it better. And I think that's an affirming act. Absolutely. So with that affirming act in role modeling, how you take feedback and creating an authentic, vulnerable conversation. Do those principles still apply with the bigger disagreements that can occur? And, and maybe are they more important to role model those types of things? I, I think it is, but let me talk a little bit about what gets in the way of our giving feedback, particularly around difficult issues. Most of us do it in the wrong way. We, the way we put it is, you, don't, you aren't sticking with your reality. So bear with me for a minute. This is a little complicated, but I, I think it'll soon become clear. There actually, John, are three realities. There's my motives and my intentions. I'm an expert on me, even though I kid myself. The second reality is my behavior, the words, the tone, the nonverbal. 
Both of us see that. But the third reality, I don't know, which is the impact of my behavior on you. So right now, I intend to be clear. I'm perfectly clear to me. Now, I don't know if I'm clear to you. Now you're, you're nodding, but maybe you've been raised to be very polite. <laughs> and uh, it isn't really true. So, so I need your reality if I'm to be effective. Because I need to know if my behavior has the impact I want. Now, with that model, we can say, Carol and I sort of say, if you stick with your reality, you can say anything to almost anybody. And we put the almost in because we're academics and we always cover ourselves. But with two glasses of wine, we'd say, if you stick with your reality, you can say anything to anybody. And the trouble is we don't stick with our reality. So I want you to envision a tennis net between the first and second reality, between what you know about yourself and your behavior. And as you can't play in the other person's backcourt in tennis, you can't go over the net. We go over the net all the time in feedback, and that's what causes problems. So I say, well, John, um, you just don't really want to cooperate. Well, how the devil do I know what you want? I'm making an assumption. Or we say, the trouble is you have a bad attitude. Well, I've never seen an attitude. I've seen behavior that causes me to draw a conclusion. And it's those sort of attributions. You just want to dominate. You just want to win every argument. You just want this. And that's why people get defensive. But if I stick with my reality, if I say, John, you've interrupted me three times, which you haven't, so I'm making this up. <laughs> if you, you've interrupted me three times, and um, I feel um, uh, ignored. I feel um, devalued. You can't say, no, you don't. You're over my net. I mean, my reality is my reality. You're likely to say, well, I didn't mean that. So now we can start to work on it. And, uh, and so around raising the important things, I would keep two things in mind. One is, what's the behavior? How is it impacting me? And is it likely to be costly to the other? So if you're not very receptive, I may want to add, you know, when you interrupt me a lot, it doesn't increase my desire to listen closely to what you say. I'd really like to, but you know, that's, that's, that's one of the effects. So I'm speaking to your best interest. And I think that if we hold a vision of what we want, John, I really want a relationship where we do listen carefully to each other. Can we work on this? Then I think even major issues can be dealt with. I love it. I love the analogy. Uh, the tennis match makes so much sense. And I, I remember uh, in, in reading about your work that we know our thoughts, we know our behavior, we know their behavior, but we don't know their thoughts. And I think if that's, that's the, right, right, that's the part. Can we, and I know this is absolutely the dangerous part that you're talking about right now. Can, should we spend any time trying to figure out what their thoughts are from their behavior? Or are we no. just going to be projecting? our own stuff. We're, we're going to be projecting. And then what it does is it gets us to playing uh, <clears throat> prosecuting attorney. So I have a hypothesis of what's going on with John. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask leading questions. John, isn't it true that uh, you feel better when you have the last word? Well, that's not really a question. <laughs> <laughs> that's an accusation in cowardly terms. Um, so when we start to make up stories, I'd want to try to have us, I think that's a natural tendency. We want to understand the other, nothing wrong with it. It's only wrong if we act on it. So I'd want to pull back. In fact, a colleague of mine says, when I'm making up a negative story, let me see if I can make up a positive story. And if I do that, then I realize, I don't know. And I start to get curious. And if I get curious, and if I raise the issue, you'll tell me your motives. I don't need to figure them out. And you may say, 
Well, David, the reason I interrupt you is you repeat yourself and you say the same thing twice. <laughs> oh, I'd say, okay. So if I cut to the chase, will you not interrupt me? We got a deal. Hmm. It seems so simple when you put it that way, right? And you're, you're getting to that state of curiosity. And like you mentioned, even in relation to the 15% is finding out about the other person's model of the world, where they're coming from. Yeah. If you don't have that information, then you can't make a good decision on what you should do with your behavior and your communication. That's right. That's right. I like that. And if I truly want to understand your world, that's an affirming action. And I want to do that not to manipulate you, but so we can work better together. So when we think of a work situation, and if we're close colleagues, I need to know what pressures you're under. I need to know what issues you're having with your boss and other key players. Because not only does it allow me to understand those times in which you may be short and so on, but maybe I can be helpful. So this is why knowing other people, certainly with friends, certainly with family, but also with work colleagues is important. This seems like very grounded, centered, person-centric, empathetic, authentic building relationships. It takes time, it takes energy, it takes commitment and, and discipline. And the idea that comes up is that notion of speed of trust, that you can only go as fast as the amount of trust that you have in that relationship. Is that, is that related to some of the concepts you guys discuss in, in your books? Um, it's related, but in an opposite way. <clears throat> that is, I don't, if I wait until we have trust, I'm going to wait until the cows come home. I've got to take the risks. And if successful, that's going to build trust. So trust is a product, not a precondition. Now, it takes time, but it actually takes less time than one thinks. And again, this is where the 15% rule comes in. I find that uh, in conversations, I can respond at the same level of openness as you do, or I could drop at 15%. So... You, we may be talking about the pandemic and you may say, yeah, it's really been hard for me. And I say, yeah, it's been hard for me too. And I could share why it's been hard or I could say, well, in what ways has it been hard for you? And that drops at 15% and starts to build a little more trust. Now, again, uh, I can't fake it. If I really don't know about you, if I really don't want to know about you, it's gonna come over as inauthentic and that's gonna hurt the relationship. So again, what we say is you don't do this with all relationships. Many relationships I wanna keep on a, just a friendly, casual level, but I wanna figure out which relationships are important to me. And am I willing to take the risk of moving along more quickly than I thought we could? So in that sense, um, and thank you for that, a very affirming, it's very humorous like it's related in a completely opposite way which is a very kind way to say <laughs> it's the opposite way of potentially what you're thinking and i think what you're really saying is really important it's an active process you don't just have trust that you have to be conscious of this process and knowing hey is this relationship going to be repeated or we have long-term relationship what do i want in this relationship and am i willing to go there to drop it down as you said the 15 either on my end or to inquire for you to dig deep into your world as well, rather than it existing, you have to actually make it happen or at least create a situation where that can develop. If I want more relationships, mm -hmm. but if I want to go through life, in essence, just uh, having the relationship determined by chance or by you, okay, but don't complain to me that I don't have good relationships. It's one of the things that we stress is we all have more choices than we think we have. And I may not want to take that choice, but we say to students, don't use the word I can't, because technically I can't is a physical possibility. I can't jump over my house. But most of what we do is a choice. 
So let's take a difficult issue that you mentioned before. I, we say, don't say I can't raise it. Say I choose not to raise it. Now that may be a wise choice, but it's a choice. And if we own all of our actions as choices, more possibilities usually open up. Brilliant. I love it. As part of the tools that we have to develop those exceptional relationships, you know, imagine conversations are a huge part of that. I know that you've written about that as well. At Key Conversations, we think conversations are the key. What are, if you don't mind me asking, are there any significant conversations that you've had either personally or professionally that had a big impact on you personally or professionally? Have there been conversations that have had a big impact on me? Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> many. Um, many as I, um, as I get to know other people at a deeper level and know about their life. Um, it makes me aware of more of the world. It makes me reflect about my life. Uh, feedback that I have gotten has uh, profoundly changed me. It hasn't often been easy to hear. There have been times in which I've been initially resistant, as my wife would tell you. Um, but um, these have had major impacts on how I see myself and, and how I operate. But if I walk around saying, I've got to present an image of perfection, I'm not going to learn anything and I'm not going to be very effective. Fantastic. Excellent. Dr. Bradford, what's the best way for our listeners and, and watchers to get in touch with you and find out more about the work that you are doing as well as your other publishing partners? Well, uh, I'd urge you to look at our website, which is connectandrelate.com. Uh, it talks about the book. We also have a self-assessment questionnaire in there that you may want to take, or even better, you may want to give to three or four of your friends and have them fill it out on you. And then you could have a very interesting conversation. So um, uh, I would urge the reader to, uh, listener to go there. Um, the other thing which uh, we're finding people are doing, I was talking to a, a friend of mine the other day, and uh, he said, um, I gave your book to my father. And my father read it, and we talked about it. And it's fundamentally changed our relationship. So if there's a relationship you really want to significantly improve, um, the other person may find it helpful to realize the concepts you're dealing with, what you're trying to do. And as an author, we always say buy two books rather than one. And uh, that may be a way in which you can both learn at a deeper level and improve the relationships that are important to you. Wonderful. I have several clients that I'm going to be buying that book for as well. So I'll put all the links in the show notes. And again, thank you so much, David, for being here. We really appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Great question. So have a great day. Thank you. And thank you all for listening and watching. Until next time, develop yourself, empower others, and lead by example.